The Digital Circles Podcast, giving a voice to Northern Ireland's business network. Brought to you by Private Label People, with your host, Paul Mooney. Here we go, another week, another Circle Back show. And I'm going to start with an apology to the two guys I'm with, uh, Michael Elliott and Robert Rickey, because I've never formally introduced you. Well, we can't say that anymore. So, well, there you go. You've been formally introduced. Will that do? <laughs> well, that's absolutely fine by me. No, uh, Mike is our sound and audio guy. Is there anything else I should term you as? I'm good with that. Fountain of all knowledge. Well, he's like a player manager, isn't he? Yeah. You know, he's he's managing that whole never editing works. recording. <laughs> yeah, that never works. <laughs> that's too up. old to play, too yeah. young to manage. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got Robert Ricky, who is our all things business guru. Mm, thank you. And that's, I like that. That's. There we go. That's very good. Well, somebody had to do it. Well, I was going to compliment you on, here we go, we're back to the Circle Back show, because that rhymes. And if it, if it rhymes, it then it's good. You sound like Puff Daddy. And then we've got <laughs> myself, who uh, is all things. That was nonsense. one minute and one second, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, he just couldn't hold it in. Uh, there. And uh, I don't need to be introduced because uh, I'm just the person who talks random nonsense. I'm sure everybody has worked that out by now, but... Uh, How's things with you guys this really, week? Really good, yeah. It's been uh, not as busy this week, thankfully. It's been able to sit back a little bit, have a little bit of you know, chill time, think time. So it's always good. To, you know, at times it's great to be busy in the business, busy on the business, but also it's it's good to have a little bit of breathing space where you can kind of sit back and start you know, thinking, having some thoughts, making some notes to then take it on to the next level. It doesn't doesn't always go on a straight line up. Sometimes you got to have a little bit of breathing and then come back and get stronger. And, and Mike, you, how's your creative juices flowing this week? Oh, I certainly have been. Uh, I have been uh, all over. I've managed to get out of Belfast for uh, for for the first time probably Ever? since last uh, <laughs> last summer. Uh, you so found the M2 then, Mike? <laughs> on the road out to Donegal, so I've, I've been, you know... Sounds like through. a Hugo Duncan song. Well, <laughs> maybe. Should be, if not. Yeah, on the big border. shout out to Hugo Duncan. Uh, yeah. Get him on the podcast. He, on the What is it, the song? On the border road, use a border code and flash your lights at me. Big hit. It's a big hit. It's all where, about... Where was it a big hit, though? Was it as <laughs> big a hit as this show is in Mexico and South America? No, Does like, Hugo speak Spanish? That's what I want to know. Hugo is, sp- is a Spanish name, though, isn't it? Hugo uh, Sanchez, yes, of course, yeah. There you go. Maybe uh, Hugo Duncan is absolutely huge El in Hugo. the Central and so- South American region. He is now. <laughs> because oh, our Mexican listeners on uh, South America, Central America have just picked him, picked him up. Well, actually, Paul, I'll, uh, normally you ask the questions, but okay. I'll, I'll jump in. You had a, a special day this week. Oh, yes. Did you indeed? It was your birthday. <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday. You kept As that one quiet. My, my terrible uh, speech impediment <laughs> kicks in and I'm told <laughs> that I say birth, birthday. Birthday. <laughs> Can't and say birth. <laughs> I, I noticed you got a great gift from your from your family. I, I saw the... The unboxing, so to so to speak, it was it was tremendous. I really enjoyed it. My Mexico shirt. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> it, it's a smash shirt. I haven't worn it yet. I'm keeping it for uh, our roadshow in ah. Cancun. And weirdly, I always preferred the Mexico away shirt, the white one. I don't mm. know. It just it just looks better. I yeah. think it's just that white rather than uh, the home shirt. So it looks it looks really cool. Thank you. I just need the the hat to go with it. The what, and the football skills. <laughs> 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 Sombrero and the Silero, story of my holiday life. But uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I had a great birthday. Thank you for my ma- <laughs> again birthday. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning it. It was uh, it was excellent. Not not telling you what age I am. Forty four, shocking. Anyway, we had Michael Carvel in with us last week, head of the PFA Northern Ireland, mm-hmm. and I thought he gave a really good insight into the work that they've been taking on in local sport, local mm-hmm. football, and it br- brings you around to thinking how sport ties into business and actually that is really the direction the podcast has been taken in recent times and having some sports people on and telling us about their business life and there is a, a definite correlation there when you think about it isn't there Robert? Mm. Carvelation? A co- <laughs> <laughs> so I'm surprised you didn't think of that one um, yeah that's, that's particularly poor you, you might want to edit that out uh, there is there, there absolutely is and I think what Michael was talking about on the last episode, you just got to see how in depth 
a, a business, which it is a business, albeit related to sport, and and sort of more, I guess you'd call it a corporate body, or it's not governmental, but that type of business. But you got to see just how in-depth it actually was. It wasn't just, say, you know, look at after the players, because that has multiple strands. He was talking about, you know, dealing with agents, contracts, parents of young footballers, because... Whenever they're moving to clubs, they're obviously at a, a very young age, so they wouldn't have that experience, and you know they can be mismanaged, they can be missold. So all of that stuff that the the Players Football Association, not just in Northern Ireland but across the world, does for those players is absolutely brilliant. And then it goes on further and further and further, you know, dealing with mental strength, emotional strength, and mm-hmm. um, all of the things that that come along, and and much much more. So there is. A lot of depth in there, but also what I really liked was, which you could hear from Michael, being a, a previous professional footballer, was that passion that came through that he was doing something that he had a love for. Absolutely. And I tell you, you led there, Rob, with um, talking about you know whenever, ki- uh, whenever they're coming in at a young age into uh, footballing as uh, you know as a profession it's very easy i suppose to forget that it's not only the teams that are uh, the business in that regard but each individual player is their own business and is having to put on you know grown up businessmen shoes uh, at a very early stage and a bit of guidance sir invaluable well also as you say there mike michael spoke last week and what he said was you know at that young age being thrust into the other team if you've gone, you know, across to a bigger country. So people from Northern Ireland, obviously our league is smaller than the English league, mm-hmm. so therefore going across there, but you're immediately in competition with the other player, yeah. as well as maybe an older player in your position, and maybe even a very experienced player in that position. Mm-hmm. So rightly so, as you say, you're your own business. you got to look after all that, and it just doesn't go for team sport. No, it goes for, and not just football, it goes for rugby, it goes for cricket, it goes into single person sports like boxing or tennis or golf, because you're, you are you are the business. Yeah. And whenever you take that to the nth degree, say somebody like Rory McIlroy or Carl Frampton, who operated on a world, uh, operated being Carl, but Rory operating on a world level, think what it's like at that stage. I know. And what has to develop around the business of Rory McIlroy or the business of Carl Fronten? Yeah. yeah, I've actually been watching a little bit of that uh, oh, golf yeah. thing on Netflix. I can't I Full swing. That yet. Full swing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's supposed to be very good. It yeah, good. and it's sort of it actually it makes you think about young players and that fear of failure. They they don't actually for young footballers it seems don't have a big fear of failure. They all believe that they're going to make it, but whenever they don't, it's the ramifications of that and the shame that they feel. And I thought Michael really touched on that well. Mm. It's not something that a lot of people think about. If you think about somebody like Luke Littler in, mm. in darts, I know you're going to watch the darts. Is it tomorrow night? Yes. Yes. Uh, and I think he's actually playing. Uh, yeah. Mm. I presume that's the name for... Uh, throwing maybe is that the is that the name for darts? Could be. He's throwing tonight, or is he is <laughs> yeah. he playing? It, you know, you play darts, but. You wouldn't say, is, is Luke Littler playing tonight? I mean, yeah. you're opening up a whole ballpark there. What's the verbiage? What's the uh, what's the collective noun for darts players? <laughs> yeah. That's a good one, actually. So everybody listening, I think you should think of what is the collective <laughs> noun for darts players? Yeah, it just sounds like a, like a rat in Belfast. Just loads of people <laughs> throwing things at with things. But uh, yeah, Luke Littler's, what, 16, 17? Something like that. Ridiculous. Yeah. And, and it's how young he is and that level of fame. It's already... Got a little bit too much at times, and and that's mm. that's darts. So you can imagine, even in other sports, it's magnified, maybe even more so. But I've a I've a funny fact actually um, on a young darts player. Uh, do, do you know the way darts players tend to have nicknames? Like I don't know, name me one. Um, <laughs> Jockey Wilson was Jockey Wilson. <laughs> uh, well, Eric Bristow was the crafty Cockney. Crafty Cockney. There you go. Well, uh, there was. <clears throat> There was one called um, 
Actually, I don't know what his surname is, his first name is. But it's <laughs> I was going to say, if you do a little bit of surname, there was a, a darts player called Bob. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a clue. His, his surname, Are you making up darts players at this point? His surname ended in Bates, so have a guess what his nickname was. Oh, jeez. Yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> it actually got. Norman? It got banned. I, I heard. I think yeah. I can guess where we're going. Yeah. <laughs> Ali McCoy, I listened to you on TalkSport recently and he could not stop laughing and he was furious that it got banned. He wanted him to keep it, but uh, of course his, <laughs> his, uh, his nickname is Master. Of course it is. Of course. And if you do want to watch Ali McCoy actually breaking down in a, in a flood of laughter, go and do a, a YouTube search for Ali McCoy, Alan Brazil, uh, his co-commentator, and the magician guy of Phoenix Knights. Because they brought him on, I can't remember his his stage name of Phoenix Knights. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. The oh, he does. He's he's very like the other guy. Um. Yes, the uh, the actual one. But go and do a search for that. That's quality. McCoist just breaks down, and his 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 Zoom connection and everything goes. Yeah, that'll, <laughs> that'll come back to him. It he sort of plays on Derek Akora. Yes, in a very loose way. But yeah, he is he is pretty funny. Uh, but it got me thinking the the nicknames, uh, both in sport and localized nicknames here, which is is always a good one. Uh, there's a few. There's a few here actually. Uh, we'll do we'll do a couple of footballers. But Neil Poynton, do you remember him? Played for, for play for Everton. Yeah, who and his was? She says, no, I should I should actually know that, but I don't. Dessa. Disappointing. He was actually quite disappointing. <laughs> yeah, and then famously we have uh, Fitz Hall, who's oh, nickname for was Portsmouth. Yes. Fits all, fits all. One size, one size fits all. There you go. There you go. Oh, um, yeah, but are, we have the best nicknames in this country. I, I really do. I think if there was like an Olympics for nicknames, we would we would clean everybody out. Like uh, absolutely. I've uh, I have a personal favorite. Uh, a couple of my mates are from Ballybean, and they know a guy, and he's called Sammy Megadeth. <laughs> so I said, "What do you call him, Sammy Megadeth, for?" And the reply was, we well, has got long hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> she says simplicity and it's true as form, uh, but it works. We, uh, we always do the little, what businesses have you mm -hmm. been to? Any jumping out? Yeah, well, Mike was talking about being up in Donegal. I was over in the other coast, the northeast coast. I was up in Port Rush there last week. And a favourite sort of haunt of mine to go to is the Bushmills Inn in the town of Bushmills. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's a food place. I'm going back to, I'm straight back into food. You know, I'm just I'm just straight there. But it's fantastic. Like it's just it's a, it's a solid nine out of ten every single time. But not just about that, but I also love the very first time that I went to Bushmills Inn, I was driving into the into the car park, and I looked up on top of the the building, which it kind of resembles a bit of an old fort. I think they've mm. you know redone an old building That's and brought it back place, to life. Like. Yeah, and they've still got a piece of that you know, fort the way it would look, and on top of it there was a Japanese flag flying, and I went. What, what, why is there a Japanese flag flying? And I went in and I just went up to the... Did you say Kenichiwa? I, I, I was sort of, I was looking for the reason why this was going to be there. So spoke to the guy behind the desk and sort of went, why, why is there a Japanese flag on top of the fort? And he says, well, here at Bushmills Inn, what we do, because they also have a hotel part as well mm -hmm. as a restaurant. They say, we fly the flag of the most travelled or the longest travelled guest who's staying there I like that. that evening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, that is fantastic. Just little bits. So the other day, as I was driving in, I went, please be Mexico, please be Mexico, please be uh. Mexico. <laughs> it was France. Yeah. I was did disappointed. You not, did you not ask him to take it down and put up the St. Field coat of arms? <laughs> <laughs> I think the French would have travelled a little bit further, but I was, I was going, if this is Mexico... Uh, that will be my my day made, but it mm. was it was France, so that was that was my little story of uh, of last week. Done. <laughs> anyway, what about you, Michael? 
Uh, I'm going to start with the food one close to home, and I've actually got two. So uh, the food one's going to be a, a, a quick one. Is uh, seed on the Lisburn Road uh, for those times whenever you're sort of feeling like you want something akin to a burrito, but you're looking for a bit of a healthy option. If you do go to seed, I would say my recommendation is going to be the uh, satay, but ask for it to be a bit spicy. Uh, and that was the absolute business. If you teamed that up <coughs> with the sticky toffee pudding with ice cream that I had at uh, Bushmills Inn, that that could make a that's a good oh, it's a party piece. Pudding. That's a good yeah. yeah. But they were actually serving it on the menu with fresh cream. But I just don't agree with that. I'm one of those people that yeah, I am one of those people that look down the menu and go, I could change this, <laughs> especially <laughs> on desserts. Get both. But whenever they said, like with fresh cream, I said, no, it works better with ice cream. So I had sticky toffee pudding with that butterscotch sauce thing oh, that they had uh, over the top. Uh, yeah. The perfect combination with a bit of custard and then a wee bit of ice cream as well. Two, two, tremendous. two good shouts, I have to say. Is you have another one, Mike, do you? I do. This one was more so uh, a sort of on the road again one because we were obviously driving back and forward to Donegal a bit. And uh, one of the stop-offs is in uh, Derry, London, Derry, Stroke City, whatever you personally call it. Derry Anderson, Metropolis. Yeah. yeah um, is uh, Geese. 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 It's, it's the Geese. best name for a place ever, but it's actually an off-license. Um, and we stop off in there and they, I think, it could be selling anything really, but what they've done very successfully is they've recognised people can go online now and get any amount of, uh, you know, hipstery beers or IPAs or wines or whatever and they've made it so that they've given you a reason to go into the shop where when you go in there, quite often, I find myself, I need a bit of a steer in direction and the trying something new or doing something new and they've got a cracker selection in there of uh, of like like local ones and not local ones that would make you make you stop every time on the way past. And I fancy thought, beers. Fancy beers. Fancy beers. And it just made me think like that's a that's good like you I mean rather than uh, just going on the Amazon or going on the any of your sort of websites and ordering up the stuff to home. Maybe reason to stop in. I think as well, you know, especially around beers and, and things like that. It becomes very homogenized, doesn't it? You know, you go into the general chain or uh, the supermarket and it's the same selection over and over again. Whereas if you go somewhere like that, a little bit more independent. Yeah. And an independent actually trying something different. Mm. Now not not ridiculously different, but just a little bit different. And it really sticks in your mind then. Then you get talking about it or you speak to somebody or if anybody's passing that way, you say, yeah. oh, you must call you must call in here. And you speak to anyone from the city and they are very proud or they at least go a lot to it. So it seems to be working. So yes. I thought that was a, was a good shout. I like the idea of you know? sort of changing what, you know, that whole idea of the homogenization of, of things, just making it this the same, you know, just regurgitating exactly the same. Because mm. what do you... What do you expect to get out of that? You know, if you're just a smaller version of a supermarket and you're really only getting business because you're local, well, you'll do all right, but that's all you'll do. You'll just do all right. It's the rule of 10%. Mm -hmm. And whereas if you change it up a little bit, you will not just get local business, but you'll get, you know, passing trade, you'll get word of mouth, people start talking, you'll get outside of local business. It's it's very much like, I love the farm shop here in, in Sinfield mm. because... A, the food is fresher, you've got a much better selection, mm -hmm. all those different things, and they're not the supermarket. And I think everybody, like consumers and people alike, we're starting to realise, let's not go to the supermarket and buy stuff because... It's the same thing, <laughs> yeah, over it, and over and over again. It's all boxed up, the quality is nowhere near as good. People will argue that it's more expensive to shop locally. I completely disagree, because... Yeah, the actual individual items may be more expensive, like your potatoes, your vegetables. But that's all you're buying in the local shop, and it's better. So mm -hmm. you're getting more for your money. And also, whenever you go to the supermarket, you're you're not conscious with what you're buying. And therefore, they're putting things in front of you. I mean, their marketing is obviously off the chart. But before you know it, you've got packets of jammy dodgers and jam donuts and all this. That The shop, the overall shop, will be more expensive. Yeah. yeah. Stuff you don't need. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Geez, is geese G E E Z or what? No, no, it? no. It's G E E apostrophe S. Yes. Like oh, like geese a few beers. Well, I, I, I mean, <laughs> well, it's a surname. <laughs> it's a surname. G sure G E E. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Have they a Japanese flag flying outside? No, a French one. I'll get them to update it next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the thing that surprises me here is that we don't have more drive-in bottle shops. You know, like you get in Australia and the US and Canada. And yeah. Stuff. We, We've won the one in Fermanagh, don't we? A drive-in bottle shop, drive-through, not drive-in. Drive yeah, drive-through off type. license. <laughs> That's why we crash in through the wall with a mask on. But the drive-in off license, like a drive-through one, and and I I think uh, beside Chicken Goujon Mountain in Enniskillen, which is also another great local business. Hang we on. need to. We need to. We're, we're not gonna. We're not gonna uh, elaborate on Chicken Goujon Mountain, which sounds like <laughs> the greatest place on earth. <laughs> so, Ro- I I. <laughs> I've probably sickened myself on chicken goujons. I've had too many of them, but I still I still like them, but not as much as I used to. But for a while, it was becoming quite an addiction. It was a bit like, do you remember Alan Partridge got addicted to Toblerones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was turning into that for me. Uh, there was buckets of them in the backseat of the car at one stage. <laughs> but no, Robert and I used to spend quite a bit of time down in Fermanagh, still do. Mm-hmm. And we used to drive. There was a, there was a garage in... Clocker. Clocker. And it's a great... Sandra uh-huh. type thing, but it always had an insurmountable portion of chicken goujons available for you at any time of the day. It sort of hasn't anymore, I have to say. They've, they, they they put a time frame on it now, yeah, which is they've curtailed their, yeah. their chicken goujon serving times, which I'm, I'm not best pleased with. But it was, there was a lot of, the quality was very good, and we, uh-huh. we sort of said it must have been a Fermanagh thing, because you couldn't get it anywhere else. Yeah. But then we went to another one, also in Fermanagh, uh, just out the other side of the of the town of Enniskillen, to, going towards Locker and Golf Resort, and it's called Lilies. Okay, exactly the same chicken goujons, but a lot more. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I went in one time, and I've never seen an amount of chicken goujons quite like it in one in one area. <laughs> it sounds right. like my heaven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. and yeah. then I noticed. I went out to listen to ski, also in Fermanagh. Oh, jeez, I know what's coming here. And went into the local garage there, and I was looking at the, the chicken goujon mountain that they had. It wasn't the same size as the other place towards Locker and Golf Resort, but it was still pretty impressive. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to have to. My addiction was pretty strong, too. <laughs> went in for some chicken goujons, and they didn't ask me how many I wanted. That's it's it. sort of it's a bit strange because normally it was always to do with how many you wanted. You didn't realise that you were actually standing on a set of scales, <laughs> <laughs> and they were looking at it and going, yeah. "I know exactly how yeah. many this guy wants." <laughs> with my, they did the, they also did the Fermana look you up and down for for portion oh, size. Yeah. They sort of look you up and down, left to right, and go. I know, I know what he needs, and they put them back and they weighed them, and I went, "All right, changing away from the the number." And they went, yeah, because farmers come in and say, give us six, but don't be giving me any of them wee ones. I only want the big ones. So they had to move uh. to to curtail the farmer exploit of taking all the big goujons. <laughs> <laughs> Which, whose chickens were probably super <laughs> supplied <laughs> by the same farmer. Yeah. Well, you raise a very good point. No, I mean, goujons aside, obviously your service stations, your sort of your filling stations, they are, they are many and varied. And you can go in the ones that are terrible and all you get is a handful of magazines and a coffee and a chocolate bar, basically. Or you've got your apple greens, you've got your more local, maybe you tend to find them around Middlestar a bit more, where they're like big and they're, service, they're doing the job of a supermarket as mm-hmm. well as the job of a filling station, as well as the job of a cafe. So uh, chicken goose on the side, what do you reckon makes for a really good filling station? Oddly. It also depends on the size of the town. I'm yep. going to argue. Listen Ski being a very good example. Mm-hmm. Listen Ski is just too small to have a big supermarket. True. So therefore, as you say, the garage kind of fills that void. But because the garage is kind of not connected, you know, they're not dictated to as much. If you get a good sort of commercial manager or products manager uh-huh. who's in that, oh, they can do a wonderful job. Mm. So I think one element is the size of the town. 
Absolutely. Well, I think that dictates it quite heavily. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the one in Clocker, I have to say, I think there was a magnet attached to the building and also attached to my car at one stage because I could literally feel the car pulling into the car park every time, <laughs> it drove, no matter what time of the day it was. And it, it's quite good. But there's one, and it's actually not a service station, so maybe it doesn't quite count, but I'm going to put Rath Freyland on the map here. Okay. There's a place in Rath Freyland called the Milestone. Oh, my word. Does uh, it beat five ways in Uri? Is it similar? <laughs> I, oh, yes, we did. Go to, on the way to Dublin Airport, it was very good. It was very good, yes. Pleasant surprise mm -hmm. in there. That uh, was excellent. Uh, I think that's the best thing in Uri. It's got a lot of competition. I know. Pause for effect. But... Uh, it <laughs> <laughs> like every, every single element... Oh, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> uh, <th> but every <laughs> element of that five ways is fantastic. Like yeah. they've got a mini supermarket, which is which is great. Then once you go over into like fresh food for taking home and cooking, yeah, like oh wow, it, that's really where it starts to elevate. And then the cooked stuff, oh, oh yeah, they've, they've just moved it into another stratosphere. Yeah. We have a theory that uh, no matter where you go in the world. The very best chicken curry on chips you'll ever get is from filling stations in Mid Ulster. Absolutely, <laughs> <That's just laughs> yeah, the best. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, that one in Uri strong. The one in Rath Freyland is. It's just this. It's like Disney World of <laughs> food and <laughs> beverage. It's you walk in and you you sort of turn around the corner and you go, my you know, that goes away down there. And if you oh. get a map, could somebody give me a map here? And. Uh, it's Thank unbelievable. You. The hot food counter and the deli. Oh my! Did you get like a like a fast pass to, to, to pick up your it's your grub? It's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. You're just waiting on Reg Holdsworth walking out from behind the counter. And <laughs> I kind of want to go to Rath uh, right? Yeah, I have to either. say honestly, I went in and I got. I was looking for, funnily enough, a portion of chicken goujons, yeah. and the lady said, "Many would you like?" No, so she didn't qualify the way the other girl did. But I said, "I I, um, I don't know, maybe it's five enough." And she says, "You look like a seven man." I went. Yep. Thanks. I think. So she did qualify <laughs> it. The same. I just didn't weigh them, but she, she was looking at numbers. She didn't want to be rude from the outset, so she got there eventually. Uh, but I can't complain because it was for my own good, I think. And then she said, "Do you want some chips with it?" And I said, "No, no, just goose." And she went, "Okay, oh, you'd have to take some chips." Uh. So I said, "Right, okay, we're into chips now. Okay, this is good. This is substantial." And then she said, "Do you want a wee bit of sauce?" And I said, what sort of sauce have you got? Uh, there's, by the way, for, for all of our listeners, Paul has the most shameful expression on his face right now. <laughs> <laughs> so at every step of the it's, way. Yeah, pure was, disgust at myself. Gluttony. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't good. I, uh, well, I ended up with peppered sauce smothered all over this thing. Oh. And I went out to the car park, and it wasn't just a little portion of chips. This was a full chicken supper with peppered sauce. And I couldn't drive after it for about 45 minutes. I had to have a nap. Right. I think it's because you knew that was going to happen. Yeah. But then as you were getting up to the counter, you just started kind of lying to yourself that you weren't going to do that. But you you secretly knew. Yeah. And it, it's, it was dangerous. Uh, I'd like to thank that lady for contributing to my inevitable <laughs> downfall with heart disease. But uh, I know what a store it really is. It's got great... Uh, off license as well everything's fantastic isn't it? if you ever take a step back when you're in one of these like let's call them uh filling station superstores and you actually look at what they're doing it's it is incredibly intelligent in the good ones because they're servicing almost exclusively immediate needs and immediate requirements nobody goes to a filling station to buy you know stuff that they're going to need over the course of the month it's always like i need this now i'll go there and as a result, I imagine that leads to like impulse buys. It leads to you know all these things. So like as a social science, watching the way they lay it out is actually yeah. clear. There's a lot of thought. I think another it. element to it, not just about the town, is also the way to, to sort of tie in with what you're saying, Mike. Is the way that they acknowledged and then built on the customer base that they had. So. The likes of filling stations and garages, they would obviously get a lot of what I would call workies, you know, like guys that work on the road, yeah, um, you know, fixing the road, putting up fences, painting the roads, doing all, all that work, contractors. And they would generally be in a van and they're calling in to get their petrol and not even just at lunchtimes, in the morning time, 
where yeah. they're picking everybody up to go to their destination. So they were always kind of in the band newspapers, you know, maybe a drink or whatever, and then they'd pick up some food in the morning. Yeah. Because they were getting out early, uh, as in out of the house early to go to work. And then they'd be on the road again during the day. They called in to get some lunch. And I feel like those guys just started to look and go, that's where that client base is coming from. Mm-hmm. And then they realized, hang on a wee second, there's another client base that are going after a similar thing, but just not exactly the same style. So they've then moved it out to, I guess you call it maybe more artisan styles of, yeah. of foods. And then they realized, like the likes of that Five Ways place or the other place in North Island, they've realized that here, when's the best time to sell food to people? It's when they're hungry. So therefore, not only are you in to buy something to eat right now, uh, here's some stuff that you can buy now to cook at home. And they just went, nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. It works a charm, though. Yeah. There's ones you just wouldn't drive past. You could be, you could have eaten as much as you could possibly eat and going past, you're like, well, I'm not wasting this opportunity. I think I it's a great, it. yeah. I think I really do yeah. think it's a great opportunity for everybody who either is starting a business or has a business to look at the other products that are loosely related to the products that you currently sell, yeah. that your that your customer or your potential customer are buying, that you can do either in a slightly different way, either presentation wise or an ever so slight difference to the product, because the customer's there and it's convenient for them, or if it's slightly better or you're going to present it in a different way, they're going to potentially swap across from a supermarket or a bigger chain. And they're going to start buying with with you, the smaller business. Yeah, service stations have become yeah like supermarkets in their own right, really. And some <laughs> labourers and things probably spend more money in a in a service station during the week than they spend on on any other uh, okay. item in life. But uh, it's funny we we work with a fellow called Ali. He moved here from London, and I remember him coming here, and he couldn't quite believe our service stations. Uh, so much so that he went into the local butchers one day thinking that it worked the same way and he bought a portion of chicken goujons and came across and proceeded to bite into one which was completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, yeah, yeah, it was interesting wrong. too, Paul, you were talking about you know, sort of like medium, small to medium sized businesses in our locale and one which I think has done an amazing job whenever you're talking about, you know, Meats and and this that and the other is very local to us here, which is Finnebrog, uh, Finnebrog Artisan, who do the naked bacon. So it's all the Super. no sulfates and whatever else. Uh. And where they've got to in such a short period of time is absolutely fantastic. Mm. Like taking a product like bacon, which has been done, you know, it's <laughs> it's so readily available in many different formats. And they just tweaked one little thing. I'm sure if they were on, they'd say they did a lot more. But uh, it's that it's that one thing that they did that really attracted some big players in the marketplace. And now, whenever I see it in the store, it's an immediate because they got it all right. Like their packaging's great, the presentation is great, that USP is fantastic, and the product itself is absolutely brilliant as well. It's wonderful to see. There is something about that area as well. Now, I'm not sure. It might be the same business owner, but, like, they have diversified in a way. If it is, they've diversified in a way that would be remarkable. I think it's a wedding venue as well, the place. Yes, I think they've got, like, an old old building which they've converted for their factory or their production, but it's bigger than what they need, so they do have something like that. There's another one a bit like Finnebrug. Not, not, like it, but I mean, it's gone quite big. You see their stuff everywhere now. Is Forest Feast? Have you seen the packets of almonds and, uh, and yes, you know, yes, 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 like Brazil nuts and things coated in chocolate? And you can get mango stuff, and mm. you get them in like in lots of butchers and bakeries you walk into now. They're a local company, and they produce. They've a they've a production place here. I'm not sure it could be an RMA or somewhere, but they've gone really big too. It's great to see yeah. uh, another another Northern Irish. They're also fun. in like convenience stores, aren't they? They're packets on yeah. a stand. Yeah, and yes, they're really I good. Know, I yeah. do know those. Their uh, their milk chocolate Brazil nuts, I have to say, are fantastic. And their dark that, chocolate. Uh, that look almonds. of shame has just come across uh, Paul Minnie's face. Again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, you, you sprinkle those on top of your chicken goujons, peppered sauce, uh, and chips. And you're but also, one of the things flat. that both of those companies are doing is they're charging the right price. Yeah. As in, 
they're not trying to discount it. No. Right? Why would they? They're going in with a higher USP, a better a better product, mm-hmm. and they're charging accordingly. And and that's I feel like a lot of businesses at the time try and discount their way into the into the market. Well, if you're homogenized, if you're exactly the same as everybody else, then yeah, there's not an awful lot else mm-hmm. that you can do. So take a little step back, think about your product, think about your service that you're that you're providing. And then try and get yourself out of that you know, race to the bottom in terms of price. Another um, two local ones uh, who have done exactly the same thing. One is uh, Short Cross Gin from just down the road. Again, you know, a premium gin. They're not trying to compete mm-hmm. with the supermarket brands, you know, the brands that are done every single day and sell in their droves. What they're looking for is that artisan dr- gin drinker or the gift market and it's twice three times the price yeah but very very successful brand you have the hench as well is it hench as well same. and jimmy nesbitt was over i think recently promoting them maybe do a search for uh, <laughs> carl frampton jimmy nesbitt that was that was quite an interesting uh, uh, evening yeah, but also talking about ball of hench and a great connection a, a super connection back to my bush mills thing um is george lawton guitars um, I just happened to do a wee little bit of research into this, and the craftsmanship of George Lawton guitars is completely—it's—it's it's like world renowned. Is this the fella who he's like Ed Sheeran famously has one of his guitars? I believe so. Um, well, that's Mister Gibson or Mister Fender, Mr. or Mister Rickenbacker. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the craftsmanship that goes that goes into it. And you know, obviously pricing accordingly because it's unparalleled. Yeah. There's no such other product. So it's taken that idea to the to the nth degree. And now you've got a product which just cannot be matched by any other company in the in the world. Does he have a shop front or is it just that they're produced <clears throat> in Balhinch? I think they're just produced in, in Balhinch. And I think it's all pretty much online. But they did a they did a, a bit of a mashup, a bit of a um, coordinated approach with Bushmills whiskey, where they took some of the Bushmills barrels, oh, very good. which is oak, I believe. Yeah. It's some it's some a species of wood, and they then made that into the guitars. So they used the wood from the Bushmills whiskey, and then they got another local artist, Foy Vance. Mm. To come down to Bush Mills with the finished article, and he played a few tunes on on the guitar. It's on YouTube again. <laughs> We're doing a bit of YouTubing, but it's like, if you do a search for Bush Mills Lawton, that's L A W T O N, you'll get the video of them crafting the um, the guitar. You'll also get the Five Ants one. But that's super. What it did also for me was saying that idea of having a connection, having a mashup, or having you know, a network into another business which is loosely connected. Now, mm. it's very loosely connected between Foy Vance, a, a, a famous musician, and really good musician, Bush Mills Whiskey, and um, George Lawton Guitars, but the connection exists. So it's just like thinking outside the box a little bit and thinking, mm. what can I do as a small business to to connect those different things together? Uh, I, th- I think if I was a millionaire... I would be one of those people that purchases loads of guitars for some reason. I just, I love the look of them. I, I can play guitar a little bit, not very well. Yeah, you're pretty good. Uh, I don't know about that, but... Uh, but you'd have a collection of them? I would. <laughs> Do you imagine having a guitar that was owned by, like, I don't know, Paul McCartney or something? Yeah. Be brilliant, wouldn't it, up on your wall? I you pick it, yeah. Yeah, until you get, you know, a bit excited some night and you take it down to play it and completely ruin it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, as long as you didn't have very um, many drams of Bush Mills or <laughs> Short Cross Gin in you, you might be all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's always the problem. But uh, I, I forgot to mention two businesses that I sampled this week. Uh, nobody will be surprised, given the prelude to this, that they are food-related. Uh, it's a common theme uh, between uh, the three of us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Once we go visual with this, people will understand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, underground dining in the North Down Riviera town of Bangor. Uh, fantastic little restaurant. It's it doesn't look like much from the outside. It just looks like a, a cafe, like a run called underground dining. Called yeah. underground dining, okay. but the food menu is 
It's a really good menu, quite traditional, but... The is it underground? It's not. Okay. Uh, the underground as in the connotation yeah. of the food? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think the, the guy who owns it has been around for a while and had a, few, had a, a couple of projects, but it, it's it's brilliant. It gets a really good name, um, and the menu was superb. And then I took my, my youngest daughter to... Ordo Pizza in Stranmelis. That's I think it, right? They've won on Talbot Street as well. Have you been, Mike? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very good. It's very good. Um, yeah. They've got uh, they've got a handful of really good, of night. yeah, and and quite reasonable, I have to say. It mm. was, um, but yeah, it, I felt a bit bad. It was a Monday afternoon, and I am absolutely shoveling a what looked to be like a twelve inch pizza down my neck. It was, <laughs> but, uh, Again, it was, why were you feeling bad about this? It's sort of you know it's it's lunchtime and you're thinking am I going to overdo this and am I not going to eat my dinner? But it's a didn't Tuesday morning dinner. activity. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's pizza's brilliant because you can get a takeaway box and then you can have it for your dinner yeah. if you want. But uh, <laughs> yes, the th- we talked about Stand Hall Festival last week and I just seen their their lineup came on my phone today. Uh-huh. Uh, going big, I have to say, guys, well done. Whoever's organising it, Mister Stand Hall, uh, yeah. definitely not him. I know he's well gone, but. Uh, <laughs> Hot Chip. Okay. okay. Very nice. Uh, do you remember the indie band Gomez? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Them. I really and like. Heather from AM People. Who <laughs> <laughs> I could do a mean impersonation of, but I'm not going to. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's the other one? Uh, another dance type band. I will I will tell you. That's good. Yeah, Hot Chip's a pretty cool kind of. Yeah. You know, like the stand has always got like a bit of a cult kind of following, and that's, that's a really. That's the almost like the perfect band okay. for Stendhal. They the Orb. The Orb is the other oh, one. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. That's yeah. My brother will be there. Hopefully not getting up the sort of mischief <laughs> he got up to when he used to go to see the Orb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no glow sticks. It's the local PSA and I'll be on route. But uh, yeah, no, the Orb. My goodness. I uh, don't know what lineup. they are now. But that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Hopefully it'll be a little bit sunnier than what it was when we went. Yeah, no uh, welly boots required. You can actually wear a pair of trainers. Yeah. Hello. To hark back to uh, to a previous guest, if you do get your trainers absolutely minging, as we say here, at the Stendhal, do take them to Killen Gilmore in uh, North Belfast, Sneaker Cleaners. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, it would be a good family festival, actually, for to take kids and mm. stuff to. Uh, that, that means that Robert definitely doesn't want to go. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I've actually got two tickets for sale. <laughs> I just <laughs> bought them this morning, but now they're for sale half price. I'll tell you, with that lineup, I don't think they'll be struggling this year at all. They'll be uh, they'll be selling that one out, which is great to see. And where's uh, that? No, where's it? Lima Valley, Waddy. Oh, yeah. that's the Lima Valley, Waddy one. Yeah, yeah it might be. Yeah. I might consider that, aren't you? Yeah. Well, yeah. if you do go, mate, let us know. You, you will have to get a t shirt with Le- Limavadi Wadi on it. Like, <laughs> I want to say that. You can sleep in the back of my van. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's been interesting, I have to say. We've uh, we've worked our way through the podcast, podcast rightly there with some random topics. But yeah. uh, yes, I would urge anybody listening to go back and listen to the other podcasts. And we also value feedback. So if people mm-hmm. can give us that, then that would be great. I'd appreciate it. But, guys, I appreciate you and appreciate you being here. And I give you a formal Definitely. introduction this week. Oh. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. You'll be proper. Who knows for next week? Yeah, it's a good job. This is not visual. You can continue to walk down the street without getting mobbed. <laughs> but it's, it's coming. But uh, thank you once again, and uh, we'll speak to you again soon.